Joining us in the Informer studio, Cathy Oddie and John Heron. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about um, a very difficult subject. We're going to talk about the perpetrators who've uh, caused you great angst over a lifetime. Three in your instance, uh, and John, one who of course uh, uh, murdered your daughter, a horrific crime, and the person involved has now we know is in the health system and we still don't know how long he'll be there is that correct that's correct and in your case kathy two violent uh perpetrators and a rapist so three men yes and none of them have faced any time or indeed the face the judicial system no. what do we do how do we move forward i mean the climate at the moment is littered with some horrific stories. We've seen the toxic culture that uh, has been widely uh, recorded and reported on in Canberra. So, you know, they say the fish rots from the head. We have problems across the country. How do we start addressing some of the, the challenges and some of the problems? Certainly. So when I reflect on what we've been seeing recently in the media about these high profile cases, um, and how hard it has been for women who are trying to um, hold people in power accountable. And they're also getting a bit of the momentum of having public opinion behind them and they're finding it so difficult. It's no wonder that people such as myself and John are finding it incredibly difficult to get justice in our situations. Cathy, the first time you and I talked, you were extraordinarily brave and half to take us through what had actually happened. And I still go back and look at that uh, documentary, not documentary, that interview that we did. It should be a documentary because uh, it's, it's chilling on so many different levels. And the rawness that you, you offered up was just extraordinary. And to think that it's now a number of years later and you're no closer to getting any justice. And th those men have, uh, you know, done it again, I'm sure. Well, absolutely. The first perpetrator of family violence against me, I know for a fact um, that he had subsequent partners that um, were successful in gaining intervention orders against him. So they had to endure the same sort of violence that you went through? Yeah, and I look at the fact that if he'd been held accountable during the time that I was raising that with the police and with court systems, maybe he would have been linked in with um, behavioural change programs to really address some of those problematic behaviours um, or at least have to face a term of imprisonment so that he didn't feel that what he was doing was completely okay. Because I, I, look, I still look back at the time when I was held hostage at gunpoint and the police attended and effectively did nothing. They took me out, um, they asked me where I wanted to go. I said, so you'd be safe. So I'd be safe, yeah. but they didn't arrest him, they didn't search for the gun, and I was dumped at Southern Cross Station, but effectively because I'd no been support. Hit, never, no support, I'd not been taken to the hospital to address my injuries. Um, I was so much in fear of my life and the threats he was making towards my friends and family members that I just got on the train and went straight back because I didn't see I had any other choice in that moment. And at that, at that time, you wouldn't have known in any way, shape or form whether or not his threats were threats that he would follow through on or just idle threats. You were traumatised, well and truly. Well, and every, I knew that and every he time you've told, I, I was going to say, and every time you've told that story, you've been traumatised again. Well, it's, it's, I tell that because also I like to reflect on how much has changed since that time. So that was 2003. It yeah. was my birthday. But yeah. to be honest, it makes my birthday very challenging every year. But it's a constant reminder to me of why this advocacy is so important because by telling our story and saying this was not good enough, the response that we got at whatever point in this point and in many other points in my circumstances, that I've actually been able to reflect back to the police what that felt like in different training sessions. And I know now that if I was to make that same phone call, I would get a very different response and he would have to face outcomes. But having said that, 
we still have so much that we need to improve and change and that's why no the fight isn't over yet there is it's all about continuous improvement across a broad range of factors mm. and I'm, I'm certain that John would agree with that. Yeah, John, John Heron you're a professional you're listening to <coughs> Kathy why didn't she get a better deal all those years ago and yes we have changed very much for the better we could we could change even more and do so much more why is this system so broken so it's it's very painful to listen to kathy's story but it's not uncommon in this situation particularly at the end of the violent perpetrators if you look at um if you have an insight if you're in the police force and you look at the we'll call it the rap sheets or criminal backgrounds a lot of these high-end perpetrators. Which they can't uh, admit to, the, uh, to not, the court. Not in court, but a police can see that um, documentary evidence when it's first reported to them. So at, in an initial phase in trying to shut down a perpetrator that they can see has an extensive history and pattern, and usually that's not going to go away. If the perpetrator is well resourced and he's that, half smart, that's another element. That adds another layer of complexity, doesn't it? Totally. So if you want to go into that realm, when they have um, solid private legal funding, can be that they're almost untouchable, wow. literally. Okay. And, that, and, that and a bit... make you feel, uh, you know, cold to the bone, hearing a professional say to you, if they've got that sort of support, they're untouchable. That's what I experienced. The first time I sought to get an intervention order was when it was already two years past the relationship finally ending. Yep. Um, it was at a point where he'd threatened to kill me, he'd sent me a message, I had evidence. I went to the local Bruns Brunswick Police, I presented that text message to the person who was the sergeant or officer on duty, yep. said, look, I've just had this, this is in the context of many years of really violent abuse yep. and he's been stalking and harassing me for the last couple of years I need to get an intervention order yeah. and at that point I was just told go out to the Broadmeadows Magistrates Court and speak to the registrar they'll help you so here I am reporting an actual crime that has been committed um, they did this officer sit down and take a statement from me no um, like I felt yet again so unsupported in the process so jump forward to the day that actually ended up being the final hearing, little to my knowledge, because I'd already gone through a couple of interim hearings and I had discovered by that point that he was actively evading being served because he committed fraud against Centrelink and was on a good behaviour bond. Um, and having this intervention order finalised would mean that would potentially see him sent to prison. Yet... On the day that he turned up to court, I was thinking it was just another me going to extend the interim order. So I hadn't told my friends or family that they should come and the yep. witnesses that I So could. again, little or no support? I could, if the police had at least informed me he'd been served, I would have made sure I had support on the day. I went alone because I didn't want to inconvenience my family and friends again. Um, he's there with an ex-housemate um, of mine who been his friend, who'd quite um, openly supported his behaviours, he'd witnessed me being um, having my head bashed on the kitchen table by him and not intervened. So I knew this particular witness on his side wasn't going to be supporting me. And the experience I had on that day is still one of the most traumatic things I've ever encountered because I went up to the um, registrar, I said, look, He's here. Yeah. I was shaking. I was in I can tears. imagine. I can imagine. And I said, look, I wasn't prepared for him being here. I didn't know that this was going to um, be the final hearing today. And he said, would you like to speak to the um, court support worker, as they were um, called then? And no one, this is like about four times into attending the courts, this is the first I'd heard of such a service. And I'm like, yes, please. About five minutes later, he points at a woman. And I'm assuming, given our conversation we just had, that he meant that that was the court support worker. And I actually asked her, are you this court support worker? And she said, yes. I didn't find out until I'm actually in the courtroom, up on the stand, and seeing her next, next to him, that it's actually his lawyer. Oh, dear. 
And I put this to the magistrate. I said, look... And what was the magistrate's response? I, it was revolting because I called him out on this fact. I said, I don't have my witnesses or support people here. I do not have any legal support um, and representation. He does. And this woman, who's now um, identified herself as his lawyer, has misrepresented herself to me as a court support worker. I still, to this day, don't know, I know how I had the presence of mind to say that. Um, and I said, I need this to be adjourned. And the response I got from this person, um, the magistrate, was, you've had more than enough time to prepare for this. We're going ahead. So this was the morning session. That's, you can validate not, this. This, this happens a lot, huh? <laughs> yes. And I deal with the intervention orders um, frequently at, at all various levels, yeah. defending and putting them on for people. So the system has changed slightly. For example, you're not allowed the um, applicants are not allowed to put the respondent into the to the dock and question it, which which was a great effort to get. Mm -hmm. Putting the thing in, in Victoria is that there's probably about eight to nine hundred intervention orders issued per day. Per day. Per day. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of them are quite frivolous. They could be literally what I term to be playground disputes or neighbour disputes. Why are they allowed then? If so they are frivolous. My view on all of this yeah. is is that the the way to to put them, to place them on, is is, is being changed in it for the good. So putting police safety orders on, yeah. normally, from what Cathy's described, you go into the police counter, they should put on a safety order. So the perpetrator knows that the police are putting the action on and they're served as well by the police. Recently I've been talking to the family of Celeste Manor and in that situation, the police top did the same as Cathy told the family to go to the Magis Heidelberg Magistrates Court on their own without what they should have done. Mm. Now, I've turned up with many clients at police station and they do the same sort of wish-wash thing. And I say, no, you put a safety order on, oh, okay, I will. Then there's that. The second part of it is you can also do it online and that's a good um, uh, initiation. Yeah. But one of the things is you can get to court and if the perpetrator then... Um, says, well, I want to put my own on, intervention order. And even if the police are prosecuting, it's not uncommon for them to turn around and say, well, two intervention orders here, let's drop that and put on a um, undertaking mm -hmm. from the perpetrator. So there's no, not even an intervention order, the ability to charge for breach. John, is it a case of, when you talk about those numbers, is it a case of we just simply don't have enough authority and enough uh, uh, police to, to, to go out and not only to service the, um, the, the demands, but to follow up. That's right. So mm -hmm. police call Saturday, Saturday afternoon service afternoon where they're serving um, intervention orders. But my, again, my view is that the volume is, is very high. So that's a lot that's of, extraordinary. So that's a number I haven't imagined. Uh, so what the, the authorities would not be... If, if you don't operate in the courts, they would know how it operates. Uh, Attorney General wouldn't have an idea on it because they're not actually active at the ground level. The police know and understand themselves, but because of the, my view is if the volume, the evidence required to put one on, for example, if you hear Cathy's story, it's, a, it's obvious that you have to put one on, but then you elevate the problems of breaching that order. So you come down hard on that, and it is a criminal offence because you've got an IVO that's a civil offence and a breach, a criminal offence. So particularly in, in the debate now about stalking and coercive behaviour, these types of things. But it's attitude too, isn't it, John? Absolutely. absolutely. We're, 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 the perpetrator will say to you, nothing to see here. Well, that's exactly what happened in my case because my perpetrator at the time was the sort of goodwill hunting-esque type of character in that at the time he was studying organic chemistry. A seasoned right? operative. But for fun, he liked to read law books. And he would, during our relationship, boast how he'd gotten off certain offences because he could argue his way out. So I knew this about him. What I didn't know and I wasn't prepared for on that day was that I would ever have to be in a position of having to question him on the stand. And in that moment, when I was having to do that, my, I just went into a state of complete numbness. To this day, I don't even know what I asked him. I think in my brain I was trying to summon up every court legal show I've ever watched in my life but he just sat on the stand and I just remember he denied 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 and 
what the final outcome of that day was, was because I couldn't present to the magistrate in that moment on my phone, that text message, he saw it as a he said, she said situation and did not grant the order. Even though I'd showed this message to a police officer on the day it happened within half an hour of it happening, and I showed it to the family violence registrar the first day that I applied for the interim order, that should have been enough. And unfortunately, my experience is indicative of many people's, and it's why now I think that if someone is saying that they're a victim of something as such as family violence or sexual assault and wanting to seek an order, there should never be a case where a person has to go and apply for that themselves like I did. It should always be that the police are applying that for that on their behalf. So, I was just going to say, um, the, the fascinating thing here, listening to both of you talking, is that at the end of the day, um, it would be m much better for all of us if we could strike the current system and start fresh. Is, it, is that the best uh, way forward? Or is it much more complicated than that? Before, um, look, there's a lot of mileage in what you say, yes, in doing proper reviews. The yeah. government's announced a review after the, yeah. the murder of Celeste Manor. Yeah. But um, I'm a little bit wary of that because really what we're seeing here is that the current laws, processes exist mm -hmm. and they're not being applied. Okay, so... So the, how can you... So, okay, so the protection mechanisms are there if they're used properly. Yes, mm -hmm. simple as that. So, you have to get the protection in the first place. Yeah, that's right. So, and you, you can't hypothesise, or, or the government likes to play in the ether where it's not measurable. But in, in this space here, where it is, and if you're in the front counter of a police station, it's there before your eyes. Certainly, they, they have difficulties because, as Kathy said, there's a lot of um, perpetrators that have their own good story. Yeah. I, I've, I've had a situation when I was volunteering in St Kilda Legal Service, which was Horrific is this, what this young girl, the same way as my daughter went through, she'd been groomed by someone over several years, she escaped, had to sell herself on the streets, but the perpetrator was able to get an intervention order on her, mm -hmm. which forced her back out on the street again. If, you could, if we could do something, one step, move, make one uh, decision or one policing action, um, that would you improve things immeasurably. I'll, e I'll ask each of you, what would it be, Cathy? What would you like to see done, if it's possible, ASAP, to help us leapfrog this, this vast challenge that we have at the moment and bring some sanity and some justice to those who've been, uh, as they say, affected? Well, the biggest change I could see is what, as I suggested before, that when someone presents either by phone or in person at a police station and reports that a crime has been committed and they're providing evidence of it, that they're taken seriously and action is taken at that moment and the documentation is created so that then the onus and responsibility is not on the victim to preserve the evidence, like what happened in my circumstance, but you've done what you're told to do by society, report the crime um, to the people in authority, let them actually take the next steps and guide you about what you need to do. And I think that's something that, that's been failed in um, historically and potentially people are still facing that now. And there is a chain of evidence, which is the, the point that you talk about. It starts there mm. at that moment. Yeah. John? I totally agree with Cathy in pursuing the crime because they are crimes. There's mm. no doubt about that. They exist in the Crimes Act. Again, we're talking about the field of intervention orders, mm -hmm. because of the volume that I've seen and, and, mm -hmm. and the myriad types of different um, situations, for example, they're very common in family law activities. So there's as many, the, the, we'll call them the uh, wishy-washy type intervention orders, yeah. drown out the seriousness of a lot of the serious ones. Therefore, if you raise the bar and the police intervene to produce evidence therein, of granting the order, but breaches of the order, and because the perpetrators have, uh, that have breached orders go on to, to do horrible things. You know, again, mm -hmm. Celeste Manor, Adrian Bailey and, and Jill Mark, yeah. the list goes too on many, and on many. and on. Horrific crimes in Queensland. But if they're breached, they, I want to use the term locked up, but they're taken very seriously. Mm -hmm. Even the fact that the perpetrator would think twice, 
will save the lives of dozens of women in Australia every year. Absolutely, because what I experienced as a result of the failure of the, that magistrate on that day was that made my perpetrator feel invincible. He came out of the court high-fiving his lawyer and my ex-housemate and he then came back to Brunswick where the suburb we were both living in and painting me as the liar to... Yeah, people to all and sundry. To all and sundry, and he then continued his stalking of me and harassment for a further eight years because he felt completely like he there, there was going to be Teflon. no Teflon. Yeah. Nothing would stick yeah, to him. Yeah. He, he was weaponised by the system, literally. Yeah. yeah, and so I look at we see now this argument out there about there's a lot of people saying that we should just abolish the justice system, mm -hmm. but. I think making that statement is actually, it's, it's not okay, because um, we can't be that black and white, yeah. because there are many people like me who have never seen their perpetrators brought to justice, yeah. and I would give anything even now for any of the three men who've assaulted me over long periods of time to be held accountable. I've had to come to my own sense of acceptance that that won't, and my advocacy work is my form of justice in its yes, own way. Yes. But at the same time, it's not okay to speak from a position, I think, where from someone who's actually had their perpetrator incarcerated to say, oh, let, let's just get rid of prisons. What about let's look at a range of justice outcomes? Because not, that's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, and I think that's what we need to expand the argument on, not the like, let's just get rid of it all. Because for some people, having their perpetrator imprisoned or the perpetrator who has um, killed their family member or done something else really horrible, is the knowledge that that person is in jail might be the first time they're feeling safe for a very long time. And, and add to that, the ability of them, if they're either not incarcerated or out early, committing horrific crimes, like Courtney's killer, Henry Hammond, they're free to do it again. Yes. Kathy Oddie, John Heron, thank you once again for coming into the studio and taking us through uh, some of those uh, stories that you've had to live through, and John, that you have not only have had, work, have had to work on, but um, when you, you gave me that number of daily mm -hmm. um, cases that uh, you speak of, um, that is, that is mind-numbing. That tells us that we have a massive problem and we need to start doing something now, not leave it for tomorrow. John Heron, thank you again. Kathy, until next time. Thank you. Uh, John Heron and Kathy Oddy in the studio at The Informer, covering a topic that uh, certainly needs to be addressed and we need not just words, we need actions too.